I don't forget, as I'm liable to do. <laughs> um, so welcome everybody to the um, Earth Sciences Information Session for the um, Everything Science 2020 orientation for the Faculty of Science. Um, and I'll just reiterate, if there's any issues at all, um, seeing the slides on the screen that's being shared, um, I will have it posted later, right after this, um, on the Brightspace, so you can go through um, and kind of see anything that wasn't clear that you can read in real time, I guess. Um, and with that, if you have any questions, by the way, drop that down in the chat and we can get to those. Um, and with that, I'll pass it off to Michelle. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Miskell, and I am the Manager of Academic Programs for the Department of Earth Sciences. And what that means is I'm, I'm the student advisor, amongst other things. I'm joined today by my colleague, Amanda Langio. And Amanda is her, Amanda, what's your official title? Lab, first year lab coordinator and TA coordinator. TA coordinator. So Amanda teaches our, uh, Amanda coordinates our first year courses for us, and she also teaches the Earth Sciences 1000 and 1002 lab, that uh, lab. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about, thank you, Amanda, for joining us. I'm going to talk to you guys about um, Earth Sciences, um, what we are as a program, what degree do you do with us, what does that look like? I'll talk to you about the strengths of Earth Sciences, because Earth Sciences happens to be one of the best programs in one of the best earth sciences programs in Canada. So I'm going to talk to you about why that is. And I'm also going to then um, tell you about some courses. If you don't want to do a major or minor with us, but you find it interesting and you just like to do some courses as electives, I'll uh, have some of those suggestions for you as well. Amanda, what are you going to share with us today? I'm just going to talk about how we are delivering Earth Science 1000 labs remotely. Um, and just some general tips on what I want you to gain from doing a laboratory course remotely and what we kind of have to compromise some positive and negatives of online learning that I have observed personally from going online in the spring. That's fantastic. I, I want to hear that too. Um, <laughs> as you can see, everyone, I'm doing this from my living room. I have two young children sat next to me right there eating their lunch. Onto the doorbell just rang because one of their friends came. So this is, you know, doing presentations in, in uh, COVID. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, sorry if you uh, are distracted or hear noises in the background. And excuse me while I tell them to shh. Cole, Cole, Cole. He's got, he's on his iPad. Cole, Cole. Can you close that door, please? Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I think we'll start now. Um, by having a look here. Oh, and I do want to say, if you have questions as we're going, feel free to either put it in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. I don't mind that. There's not too many of us here. Uh, so if you want to do that, I'm okay with that. Um, but if you're not speaking, let's just have myself and Amanda um, unmuted. And Amanda, please feel free to jump in uh, if you want to add anything to it. Okay, okay so let's get going. So um, I started off by saying that uh, Earth Sciences at Memorial is a widely known as one of the best Earth Sciences programs in Canada. And in fact, we are widely respected and recognized around the world for our excellence in research. And um, some paradigm shifting science has come out of our department in the past, and this is why. Um, but there are many other reasons that I'll share with you on the next slide. Uh, but what I want to uh, tell you about is what the degree is that you do with us. So uh, it's a Bachelor of Science degree, of course, and the major is Earth Sciences. And within that major, you can choose to concentrate um, in one of uh, four different areas, or you can uh, just follow a general comprehensive stream. Uh, at Memorial, at the undergraduate level in the bachelor's program, we don't really consider, I said you can concentrate, but we really uh, consider that the undergraduate degree is a, is a good place to get a foundational, a good solid base, a foundation in, in the discipline of our sciences. Um, and so even though we say you can, content, you can follow one of our streams as a concentration, we still really gear you, um, help you choose courses so that you are covering a wide variety of subdisciplines within our program. Um, so within the major, 
students can choose to follow the applied geophysics stream. This is different. This does lead you down a different path. Uh, you grow up and become a geophysicist as opposed to a geologist. Um, the, um, let me see, sedimentary basins and hydrocarbon exploration is another stream that we have. Uh, the sedimentary basins is for those students who are interested in sedimentology, um, uh, sedimentary rocks. Uh, hydrocarbon exploration is the oil and gas industry. Um, anything that's sort of surficial processes, that type of thing. Um, you may be more interested in volcanoes um, or uh, how magma forms. You might be interested in plate tectonics, earthquakes, and all that type of stuff, which you can do from a geophysics perspective as well, but seismic, um, the seismic, uh, that type of thing. But you can also do it from a geological perspective, petrology, tectonics, and mineral resources. Maybe you're interested in the mining industry. Um, so those types of things, um, you can uh, do more courses in those areas. We have a stream, students can follow the environmental geosciences path. That's the one that I did. Uh, I have a degree from, from Memorial in our sciences, and I followed the environmental geosciences stream and, and absolutely loved it. Um, or you can choose to do courses in all of these areas. Uh, and we just say, you know, you're doing a, a comprehensive program. Uh, I skipped over the, the geophysics there a little bit. Uh, applied geophysics is using the concept of physics, um, principles of physics such as magnetism, such as uh, gravity, such as, um, my gosh, Amanda, it's been a while since I've done this. What am I missing? Thank you, seismic waves, excellent. Uh, using those principles of physics, but to study the Earth um, and to understand how the Earth works using those concepts. So that's, that's applied geophysics. If you are interested, you can do a joint program, a joint BSc with geography, with physics, with chemistry, and with biology. We have formal joint programs. Uh, you can either do a joint major or a joint honors. Um, we have, in fact, made up, <laughs> we have made up one-off programs. For example, in the past, we had a student who wanted to do a joint program with our sciences and computer science. That doesn't exist as a formal program in the calendar, but if a student is interested in something like that, we can come up with a plan that works for the student. Um, we also offer a minor in earth sciences. A minor is eight courses. For students in a Bachelor of Science, you may or may not know this, you can do a minor if you choose. You don't have to do a minor as a science student, um, but you can do one if you choose. Um, and a minor in our sciences consists of our science 1000 and 1002. Uh, and beyond that, really, you can choose what you want from there. Um, depending on your first year chemistry, math, physics, and biology, you may be limited in your choices. Um, but if you have all of that, you can do whatever you want. But if you only have, you know, just the biology or just the chemistry or just the physics and math, there, there is still a path that you can follow to, com to complete a minor. It is worth noting that for students who are in education, that uh, our sciences can be uh, teachable uh, in education. And uh, you don't, in fact, have to follow the strict criteria of the minor in order to uh, call it a, a second teachable for education. So there's even more flexibility if that's your, your goal. Amanda, do you have anything to throw in on this? Uh, almost half of my Earth Science Assessment class every year are education students. Okay. Um, so this is a very popular science for education students. And if I'm lucky enough, I usually snag a few. Um, especially those that want to go into secondary education or higher levels of education. And right. we have some of those now that I've only been in this job for two years, but we do have some of these education students that are coming into our program and looking for a very catered um, list of courses that allow them to go forward and share their knowledge. And that's really exciting because if we people don't care about earth science and the education system, yeah. um, we're not going to attract anyone <laughs> to our program. Absolutely. If any of you guys, the students who have joined us, if any of you are interested in education as a as a career path, uh, Amanda and I'd be happy to chat with you more about about the op the opportunities or the options in our program for you. Yeah. Thank you, Amanda. Anybody have any questions before I move on to the next slide? 
Oh, look at that. Okay, bear with me one moment. Rotate page. There we go. Okay, so I did say quite boldly that Earth Sciences Ethnomorial is widely known as one of the best earth science programs in Canada. So you can't make a statement like that without backing it up with some good solid reasons. So I'm going to do that now. At Memorial, we offer a broad-based undergraduate degree. And by that, I mean we offer courses in almost all of the sub-disciplines within earth sciences. Not only that, but the instructors who teach our courses are teaching from their area of expertise. As a, as a new student to Memorial, that might sound odd to you because, of course, they're teaching from their area of expertise, but not necessarily. What I mean by that is, at Memorial, uh, a geochemist teaches our geochemistry course. A paleontologist teaches our paleontology course. A geophysicist teaches our geophysics course, or one of our many geophysics courses. Um, this is not the case with all earth science programs in Canada. You might go to a program at a, at a university in which there's only seven faculty members. Maybe most of them are igneous petrologists and paleontologists, and maybe the paleontologist is teaching the required structural geology course. At Memorial, it's not that way. We have uh, almost, I think, 30 faculty members uh, in our program. They cover almost all of the subdisciplines within our sciences. And so when you take a course uh, in our program, you are taught by an expert in that field. This is one of the reasons why Memorial is considered one of the, that we have one of the strongest programs in our sciences in Canada. Uh, so that, that's a great thing. Oh, stop it again. Here we go, work in progress. Another strength of our program is our field program. Um, in our sciences, we have two courses, two field schools that are required, and we have a variety uh, of other field courses that are optional. So a field course is something that is done completely and totally in the field, besides the report that you write on your own at home uh, or in, in the lab with your, with your uh, fellow students. Our uh, 2905, or science of 2905 field course is the first one that you do. It's called Introduction to Geological Mapping. And that's a picture of it there on, well, I guess it's, it's my left. Is it your left as well? <laughs> it says Earth Science is 2905 Cripple Cove. Uh, and that's a, a crew from a number of years ago, one of our larger classes. This course is taught over an eight or nine day period at the end of August, just before the semester starts in September. It's a required course. Uh, and it's completely done outside. Normally, once you, uh, this is one, after Science 1000, 1002, this is the first course you take in our program. And usually students come out of this exhausted, <laughs> but madly in love with her sciences because they've just done a, a one full course completely outside. Oh, it's lovely. The geology of Newfoundland and Labrador is actually scientifically significant. Uh, ge geologists and paleontologists come from all over the world to Newfoundland and Labrador to study our rocks. And our students are very lucky because this is the classroom that our students get to study in. Um, and again, students all over Canada don't have the opportunities that our students do to get out in the field and see the wide variety of rocks that we have here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, in addition to our 2905 required course, we have a 3905 required course that's taught at the end of April usually after the winter semester, after your second year. This one is five days, and you spend this one in um, Flat Rock and Torbay and, and those areas, and you're doing some structural geology. At the end of both field courses, you're going to make a map and write a report, uh, and uh, you do that in a team, a group of three, while you've got your own field note, uh, you're, you're taking your notes. Amanda and I usually join those courses, uh, and it's always a, a great week outside. Well, not necessarily the one in April. Not <laughs> it's snowing. <laughs> but we go anyway, hardy geoscientists. Uh, in addition to these two required courses, we also have some optional field courses at higher levels. And this is where those concentrations come into it. We offer field courses in environmental geoscience, in um, paleontology and reservoir geology. Reservoir geology refers to the oil and gas industry. We have field course in um, metamorphic petrology. We have a field course in, what else have we got, Amanda? 
oh, we've got an applied geophysics field course. And we, when, uh, when we don't have COVID <laughs> and when we have some funding, we do some international field courses. Uh, and we've taken our students all over the world. Uh, there's a picture there of a field course to Chile and Bolivia. Amanda, did you go to that one? No. I only get to go to like, I don't know, West Coast New Zealand. <laughs> Which is a fabulous field course. It is, it is, but it's yep. not Chile or Bolivia. <laughs> <laughs> Our students have in the past gone to my class. We went to Hawaii and we studied the evolution of volcanoes. Sitting for us, three weeks in gorgeous Hawaii it was a hard time. Um, but students have also gone to Portugal, to Ireland, to the UK. They've gone to the United States, to Death Valley, um, uh, the, um, what do you call that area? The, the, Gosh, the Grand Canyon, <laughs> all that, those sorts of places. A Chile and Bolivia is in that picture below. Um, other places, oh, Bermuda, to the research station down there. Some fantastic, uh, that's, again, it's a course. It's in the field, three credit hours. The whole thing is done somewhere spectacularly. Uh, and all of these different field courses are optional. Uh, the ones at the higher level, the international ones, do cost um, a, a higher level besides your tuition for the course, there is a financial contribution that the students have to make. Uh, and some years we have funding uh, from donors, from oil companies and that sort of thing, or mining companies to help um, mitigate those costs for the students. Amanda, anything else we can add on this one? No, I think that's good. Good. Okay, we'll move on. Oh, flip it around. Okay. Oh, this is a good one. Okay, one of the fabulous things about our program uh, in our sciences is that we have one of the best scholarship programs in the Faculty of Science. One of the best, probably the best, I think. Uh, we offer over $50,000 a year to our earth science undergraduate students. We have an entirely separate uh, scholarship program for our graduate students. Every single student who is eligible, every single student every year who is eligible receives at least one scholarship, usually more. To be scholarship eligible, you must have completed in the previous year 30 credit hours. Um, and in our sciences, we can actually award uh, students who have completed 27 credit hours in the previous year. If the year before that, it was a terrible year for you, doesn't matter. It was only last year that counts. The 30 credit hours on last year. For students in our program who had, oh, and in those 30 credit hours, it's um, 10 courses, you must have achieved a minimum average of 75%, okay? So for those students who have a 75%, 75 to 79, so a B, a high B, those students would normally receive in the range of $500 uh, each student up to $4,000 per student. For students who obtain an A average, that is an 80 and above, those students typically receive in the range of $4,000 to $10,000 a student. Uh, and of course, the, the, um, the value of your total scholarships depends on how high your average is. So the better you do, the more money you get. This is every year. I've been working at MUN now for almost 15 years. Uh, and we can, uh, so we can say that every student who is eligible gets at least one scholarship. This is a fantastic thing. If you are a good student, you have this type of average, we are going to pay you to do your degree with us. We are going to pay you to do a degree in our sciences at Memorial. This is enough money for the A students to cover their tuition and their books for the year. In addition to the scholarships that are awarded, there are all kinds of other opportunities to attend conferences, uh, competitions, um, to offer presentations, usually because at the undergraduate level, there are awards in these venues. So you can see some pictures there on the bottom. SIFT 2010, SIFT stands for Student Industry Field Trip. Uh, and it is a field trip that each year, one student from each Earth Science Department in Canada is chosen to go to Calgary for two weeks and mix and mingle and network with the oil and gas executives. Uh, and uh, over two weeks, you attend lectures, you go to their oil offices, you do field trip, you do all kinds of things. I know because I went. When I was a third year student, I was selected 
to attend SIFT. And that young man in the peach colored shirt, second in from the left, is my brother. He went about 10 or 12 years after me. And uh, at the end of the two weeks, you're in groups, and at the end of the two weeks, you have to give a presentation on what you learned and things that you did. And in this particular year, my brother and his and his group won the best geotechnical presentation. Every single person in his group was also interviewed for a summer job then in the oil industry in Calgary. So while it's fun and it's wonderful to go out and experience this great two-week trip, uh, it's great to add to your resume. It's even better if you if you win one of the competitions they have and you can add that to your resume, but you're also getting the opportunity to have an interview for a summer job because this takes place immediately after the winter semester is over in, in April and early May. Uh, so it rolls right into summer employment. This is, a, this is an example of a great opportunity um, for, for the, how scholarships and awards lead you into a, a great career path. The middle picture there is says CSEG 2007. That's the Canadian Society of Exploration Geophysicists. And there is a, a regional competition and a national competition that happens every year. Uh, and there's an international competition that the Canadian Society of Exploration Geophysicists holds every year. And in this particular year, those two students that's Tiffany Percy and, and uh, Matt, Matt, Matt. My God, what's Matt going to read that? Matt McGinnis, thank you. Um, <laughs> I can't believe I forgot that. Uh, they won the regional competition. They went on and won the Canadian competition. And then did they win the international one, Amanda, or did they like play second or third or something? They, they did something spectacular in any case. They did something spectacular. That was only 2007. Now, what, only 13 years ago. Matt is now a prof. He's a faculty member at a university. And Tiffany is a, a, an executive in an oil company. Um, I think she's with Chevron, though I can't remember. And the last picture there is Kaz. Kaz um, w uh, went to the, the AUGC, the Atlantic University's Geological Conference in 2015. And this is a conference that is hosted by, it's organized by, fundraised by, and hosted by undergraduate students in Atlantic Canada. There are six universities in Atlantic Canada with an earth sciences program. And each year, one of these six universities takes turns hosting the AUGC conference. Uh, the undergrads do. Not perhaps not the faculty, not the school at the university, the undergraduates do this. And this has been going on for 60 plus years. Uh, and in 2015, Kaz gave a presentation on his honors research, uh, and he won the best environmental presentation. Now, I'm thrilled to tell you that, as I said, the AUGC has been going on for over 60 years, and Memorial University has won the best uh, presentation the most times of any university ever. Yeah. So we're doing all right, aren't we, Amanda? We're doing pretty good. We're pretty proud of our students and our program. Um, anybody have any questions on scholarships before I move on, or conferences, or competitions and awards? Okay. Oh, let's flip this. Rotate page. Ah, the Murray Cole. Another great strength of our program is the Undergraduate Student Society, which is called the Alexander Murray Geology Club. So Alexander Murray, you guessed it, is a dead geoscientist. <laughs> Long, long, long ago, it was a British dude that came over, and he was uh, one of the uh, founding people of the Geological Survey of Newfoundland and Labrador. And it is the name of our building, and it is the name of our uh, undergraduate society. So we uh, lovingly call it the Murray Club. When I was an undergraduate student, I was very much a part of the Murray Club, uh, and really anybody is like they have an executive, like like most undergrad societies, but pretty much I think that if you're in if you're an undergraduate student in our program, you're part of the Murray Club. We have a huge, huge room uh, in the pedway between the Earth Sciences Building and the Engineering Building. Uh, and that's where our undergrad students gather between classes. Uh, it's big enough that we have a bar in there, like a, a real bar. <laughs> and we have several couches and a foosball table and um, do they still have the TV in there? Because they used to play video games, although I used to go in and drive them out of it. Um, but they, and they have lockers in there and all kinds of stuff. 
So just just by being an undergraduate in our program, you have a room and a place to go and socialize and, and network with everybody in our in our program. Um, but we do all kinds of wonderful things as as an undergraduate society. Um, what do we got in our pictures? There's lots of opportunities to build your resume. There's lots of opportunities to volunteer with, for example, the Johnson Geo Center, um, with local conferences that are happening. There are, um, we have something called the CIMM, the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy, and Petroleum. They have a conference downtown every fall at the Delta, and they look for undergraduate students in our program to come and help run, do technical things, and you know, just just volunteer. When you do those things, it gives you the opportunity to meet professional geoscientists. Uh, in our field, uh, and they get to know you, and um, it leads, you know, it leads to job opportunities, it leads to funding opportunities, and all kinds of things. Um, what else, Amanda? The students do lunch and learns uh, during the, the school, the academic year, on I think maybe Wednesday afternoons or lunchtime during that free class slot. They'll invite a speaker in from industry to come and talk to the students. We'll order pizza, free pizza for everybody and drinks. And they invite somebody to come in and talk to the students about what it means to be a petroleum geologist or what it means to be, um, um, to work for a junior mineral exploration company. Uh, I usually give a presentation to the undergraduates every year. I usually give the first one and I talk about grad school, everything you need to know about master's degrees. What else, um, Amanda, they do, uh, they plan, excursions together, they'll get a PhD student to lead a field trip, take them to the... For me, it was a support network. When I was a second year student, you're meeting third and fourth year students and you know what kind of jobs they're doing, what kind of conferences. They just tell you their experience and I found yep. that to be valuable. Um, yep. and it wasn't so intimidating. They really encourage second year students and third year students to come. It's not only the fourth year students that are there. Exactly right. Yeah, it, that's exactly right. Thank you for adding that. I found the same thing when I was an undergraduate student. Uh, in fact, at the um, I mentioned earlier the field course 2905, and I said that, that that is the very first course you do in your program, and it is done the last week of August before the fall semester begins. One of the beautiful things about that field course is that you spend eight days with every single person in your class, day and night. Uh, so by the time your program actually begins, you know, September the 9th rolls around, you've just spent a week with everybody in your class and you now have some friends and you have this, this social network that Amanda's talking about. The Murray Club, the, the executive society, the, the um, pre president and vice president, blah, 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 blah. They will come on the last night of the field course uh, and they will, sometimes they hold a social event for all the, the incoming second years coming into the program. So that everybody feels welcome, so that you don't feel intimidated to walk into the Murray Club uh, and that uh, you feel part of the group. Uh, it was one of the things that I loved most about being a student in our sciences was how included I felt. I never felt like I was a number. I felt like I belonged. Um, and uh, it was a fabulous experience, so much so that I stayed to work here. Anything else? Okay, what else have we got? Oh, so. Okay, so that's all the wonderfulness of our program, but what does it mean at the end of the day? What kind of careers are out there? So I think everyone thinks of a geologist in that traditional old school way of like the guy out in the field with his, um, yes, I can send you a link of your website. Yes. <laughs> I can nice. Will you, thank you, Amanda. Yeah. Um, now we don't have time, 130. Um, Everybody sort of thinks of a geologist as, as the man out in the middle of nowhere with a rock hammer in his hand. Uh, and yes, that, that is, a, that is a, a part of what we do. It is one option for a career in geosciences is that you can be a field geologist. No longer it's just the man out there <laughs> with the hammer. Uh, there is lots of women out there now too. Um, so there are lots of opportunities for field work, there's no doubt. But if you're not one to be working out in the field, which I was not, there are lots of other opportunities in geoscience as well. You can work uh, in the office. You can work in the field. You can work in a lab. You can work in a classroom. The, one of the most important things to understand about a career as a geoscientist is that it is a professional career. And very much like being an engineer, a pharmacist, a doctor, a lawyer, 
you have to have a license to work as a professional geoscientist in Canada. Uh, and so to have that license, you have to register with the board. Uh, it's very much like a doctor. You, we hear sometimes when doctors have been bad, we hear in the news they get their license taken away and the medical board is involved. Uh, we have that same sort of thing in earth sciences. Our students register with the board called uh, PEGNL, Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, I'll tell you something really interesting about our program is that back in the 90s when these uh, the, the standards for geoscience were set at the national level, so they created the Canadian standards for geoscience, they based the academic requirements on the degree that was offered at Memorial University of Newfoundland. So that's a pretty amazing thing. Um, so uh, obviously then the Bachelor of Science or the major in our sciences at Memorial uh, ensures that you meet the criteria for professional registration uh, as a geoscientist. And you can register in one of three ways. You can register as a professional geoscientist. You can register as a uh, professional environmental geoscientist. Or you can register as a professional geophysicist. Those are the three categories that you, uh, uh, in which you can register. It is not required for all jobs in earth sciences. For example, I work in earth sciences, but I don't have a license. However, the head of our department, my gosh, Amanda, I suppose Greg has his license. He does. He does. Okay, I was going to say the head is supposed to. Is supposed to. Yeah. Uh, the head of the, of the department is supposed to. And, and, and he is my supervisor, so I fall under him, so I'm okay. Um, but any of our faculty members who, uh, they, obviously they teach with us, but who conduct um, field work on the side and they work as consultants, they will have a license to do so. Um, so that's professional registration. The type of places you can work. Um, I've mentioned the oil industry and I've mentioned the mining industry. And yes, those are the obvious ones. Natural resources, the natural resources industry in Canada and around the world uh, are probably one of the biggest employers for geoscientists. Um, and so oil and gas uh, exploration, oil and gas development, um, mineral exploration. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that one. Um, you can set out with the goal of being a detective and you are going to find the next great diamond mine or the next Voises Bay. And if you do something like that, you might set out on your own or you might send out a set out with a, a company called a junior mineral exploration company. And this is exactly what these people are doing. They are setting out as detectives um, with, with their tools in hand, whether they be geophysical tools or the rock hammer and uh, other things, uh, and they are looking for clues. Uh, and they will collect uh, samples of specimens. They will do assays, uh, and they are looking for the next uh, mineral deposit. If they happen to find it, what most likely they will do is they will sell that deposit to a large mineral exploration company, such as Tech Minerals or something like that, and they become millionaires, <laughs> uh, and um, they go again. Does that happen every day? No, um, but it is an example of the type of, of work that can be done. You can work in a junior mineral exploration company, or you can work in one of those large uh, mineral companies, uh, the multinationals. Environmental assessment, protection, and remediation is an extremely important field. Uh, that many of our uh, graduates uh, will go into. Uh, and of course, climate change being such a big thing in, in today's world, um, this is a, a growing field. Teaching and education, Amanda and I work in teaching and education. And as Amanda started at the beginning of the presentation, this is a very important field and we encourage and we love when uh, graduates of our program go on and work in education uh, because uh, an appreciation of the value of birth and uh, all of that is, is required. You can work in research. A friend of mine is the manager of a biogeochemistry lab. Uh, those are the types of things you can do. Um, you can go to sea. You can go to the bottom of the ocean in a submersible. Uh, I tell you another interesting fact. Two of our faculty members in our sciences have been shortlisted to become astronauts. Neither one of them made the final cut, but two of them were shortlisted to be astronauts. So I say you can... You can go to the sky, you can go to the depths of the ocean, you can do all kinds of different things in our sciences. What kinds of money might you make starting out? It's a big range. 
And it depends on a number of factors. It depends on the sector that you go to work in. Are you going to work for a major oil and gas company? Then you probably are going to be at the top of that range. Uh, it, are you working, um, gov if you get a government job, you're probably starting at the lower end of that range. Um, I started out my very first job in nonprofit. I started out working at the Johnson Jail Center. Uh, and I loved my job uh, with a passion, um, but I did not start out. <laughs> Very uh, with a very high salary, but that's uh, that's the uh, the truth of, of the nonprofit world. The range is generally anywhere from forty thousand dollars upwards to a hundred thousand dollars for a science degree. Obviously, the uh, the more competitive you are when you graduate, the higher your grades and and uh, all of those types of things will carry you further. Um. I never mentioned travel yet in my presentation. I'm almost done, guys, for anybody who's, I know Amanda wants to jump in here and talk. Amanda, I've just looked at the clock. I'm really sorry. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to say that travel is a, is a, is a big um, option, that geoscientists have the opportunity to travel if they want for their work. Uh, you don't have to travel if you don't want to. I'm going to sign off so Amanda can speak. I didn't realize how long I was going. If anybody would like any information on how you declare an earth sciences degree, a major I mean, or the courses you need to do so, again, uh, Carter is going to have this presentation available for everybody. Uh, and it includes some of these courses that these are not courses uh, for our major, these are general interest courses. Uh, so there's a variety of them in, in different areas. So Carter will have all of that available to you. And my contact information is there as well. I'm sorry I talked so long, and I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. Go ahead, Amanda. So, Carter, should I be able to share now? Uh, yes, oh. you should be able to share. Um, thank you, Michelle. I'll also just say in a few minutes, no worries, um, I'm just going to pop over Michelle. and get the biochem session started. But um, I'll pass the host on to my colleague, Megan Dillon, um, so that she can Take care of it if I have to leave, but take as long as you need to answer all the questions you want to. Thank you, Carter, very much for having us today. No worries. Okay, just one second. Okay. I know technology can be weird sometimes. <laughs> I'm hoping it works. Yeah, we can see that now. Okay. Can everyone see? Can you just write? I can see. I'll well, just comment if you can't see, I guess. Okay, so as Michelle mentioned, I'm the first year laboratory um, instructor for Earth Science at Dyson, which is our introductory course for Earth Science. Um, so I really love it. I have more than 120 students per semester, so I do um, meet a lot of people. and. It's my favorite part of my job. Really, I try to learn people's names, and I'm that's one part I'm worried about this semester because it's going to be a lot of less face-to-face -face interactions with you guys. So I'm just going to first read the overview from my course outline so that you have um, knowledge on what I'm actually going to be teaching and what we're going to be doing in the lab. So this is straight from my Brightspace page. I just added it last week because I'm getting ready for this semester. So Earth Science 1000 Labs will offer an introduction to Earth Sciences by looking at Earth constitu constituents and dynamic processes. By looking at the structure, composition, and systems of Earth, I hope students will gain a new perspective and understanding of the complexity that exists within this field of science. We will visit topics including mineralogy, geology, plate tectonics, earthquakes, atmosphere, and oceans. And what's really neat about all these labs at the, is that they're interconnected. So when we start learning about the atmosphere, you will see how mineralogy has a role in that. Or in ocean chemistry, we'll start to talk about how mineralogy has a role in that, and rock formation. So they're all interconnected. You will begin to learn the language and concepts and skill set required to build a solid foundation for further work in earth sciences. And I really think it's fundamental to build this foundation before you're moving on. Because if you don't know the very basics, then when you start learning things like geochemistry or petrology, um, you really don't get the full picture until you understand this very basic stuff that I'm trying to teach you in first year. 
And the amount of information we know and what we have left to discover is truly humbling and inspiring. So I look at science as an evolutionary thing. It's constantly changing. We'll never know what we're learning today that is wrong until 10 years down the road when we figure out, oh my gosh, what were we thinking? <laughs> Um, and you never know those fairies until you you learn about them in the future. Like you can only look back um, and notice what you like. We thought the Earth was flat, for example, um, and those things seem preposterous now. But I really like teaching science. It's a different way of thinking when you think that things are constantly changing, and what you're doing is just using all the information you have right now to make the best fairies you can possibly make to better understand the Earth. And I just have a quote on my first page from one of my favorite authors, Terry Pratchett. The entire, entire universe has been neatly divided into things to A, mate with, B, eat, C, run away from, and D, rocks. And I always, I just love that quote. Um, and you're going to notice if you do my course that rocks are my favorite. Um, they're my favorite. Some people think rocks are something extremely boring. I love them. I really do. I'm super passionate about them. And I love teaching students about them. And we have in our Science 1000, we will have someone who's super passionate about our science. One of the lecture professors is super pa uh, passionate about environmental science. So again, you're going to get different experts passionate about different things in this field. Okay, let me see if I can change the page. So here are my remote lab objectives. And I've had to change them a little bit from what I'm normally expecting students to be able to do at the end of a lab. So practice asking questions. And I think this is so, so important. Uh, when I was a kid, I was afraid to order my own food at a restaurant. Um, I was afraid to order a pizza or whatever. And the more you practice asking, asking questions, the better you get at asking questions. So I'm encouraging everyone who's doing a science or any course to really ask questions. Your instructor is paid to be helping you through this material. And it's more engaging when you guys actually ask us questions and respond to us. One of the big things I noticed last semester is that people stopped asking questions and it really felt like I was teaching to an empty room. And I know that it was probably the stresses of the pandemic that caused people um, to disappear a little bit. And I'm really hoping that this semester people are more present um, and they are continuing to ask questions and get engaged with their professors. Practice reading instructions and executing learning experiments. So some of you maybe have never even followed a recipe before. And the first time you follow a recipe, it will be a disaster. You won't take all the ingredients out. You'll leave things out. Um, this is just a basic skill. And I worked in research for six years. And if you don't have all the materials out and aren't able to follow step by step what you have to do, uh, it will have disastrous results and you'll learn something by forgetting to do something but it's really important to practice this because you're not going to get better at it without practicing doing it practice doing simple calculations so i'll give you formulas and expect you to be able to uh, sub in different variables and be able to make these simple calculations to get information about earth processes further process and internalize course content and in my CEQs, that's one of the things that students say they enjoy most about the labs in this course, uh, that it really hits the knowledge that they're learning in class. It really hits it home for them. It gives them hands-on experience so that they are able to work through this information and challenge themselves and ask themselves questions as they're going through. Uh, so I think that labs are meant to do this. They're meant to help you internalize that course content that when someone's lecturing, uh, you might be drifting in and out of consciousness, whereas if you're actually physically answering questions about something, uh, you're paying a different kind of attention then. Develop better reporting and observational skills. Um, and this has to do with the language, too, that you use. The better you get at observing things and recording things, the better scientist you will be. So you need to learn the language that's appropriate when, say, describing a mineral or a rock. Or if you're watching an, exper uh, an experimental video, then you need to be able to make observations, time certain things. Um, and again, this is just a skill. So the more you practice it, the better you will be. Construct diagrams and graphs to help visualize data or processes. So you can make diagrams, you can make graphs um, that help you visualize these Earth processes that we're going to be learning. 
oh, is archaeology a part? So I'll answer that. Um, archaeology isn't really a part of our earth science process, our program. There's a different uh, program for that, <laughs> but Michelle's answering that. Um, to extract information and draw conclusions from graphs and diagrams. So again, we're going to practice in our lab manual looking at a bunch of different charts, a bunch of different diagrams, and you need to be able to extract the information and make conclusions based on looking at those diagrams. And again, all this is just practice, practice. None of us are born geniuses, and the people who do best in these courses are the people who are spending the most time practicing the content. I can guarantee you that. When I was going through, I thought there were just people that were geniuses. But I can tell you the students that are getting A's are the ones that are devoting the most time to studying for this um, material. So these, this is my framework for teaching remote labs this semester. So I have both asynchronous and synchronous components. Um, and in the labs themselves are actually entirely doable, completely on your own time. Um, I highly recommend that you do use the synchronous components of this lab to get extra support. But you can do them if you're in a different time zone and it becomes a problem to actually schedule yourself. Uh, you can do it at your own pace. So I'm going to be using PowerPoint files with audio clips. And in my slide, you can see that little audio clip. So every PowerPoint slide has a little audio clip, and you can play that to get my detailed explanation of what I want you to learn from that slide. Email support will be, uh, be provided as needed, so you can email me. My response time is generally really good, uh, 24 hours generally, unless it's the weekend or the evenings, in which case I'm off. I'm not being paid to work at that time. <laughs> Synchronous support will be offered mainly through WebEx, and I chose WebEx due to the class numbers, and it seems like the way forward. It seems like what MUN is going to be adopting in the future. So it seems like a platform that, given the remote nature of this semester, that we all have to become a little bit more pop, um, familiar with. And again, this is my first time using WebEx in a public way. Uh, so students and instructors have to both learn this. And I think it will make us better at communicating in general by the end of the semester. And you can ask questions during this synchronous session, just like you guys, good for you for coming because you're practicing the kind of stuff you're going to have to be learning uh, or using to learn in the upcoming semester. So you can use the chat function. Some of you already did that. Great. Uh, you can turn on your microphone and ask questions if that's what you're most uh, comfortable with. And it, especially if you're having trouble articulating something, you can also privately message people. So if you want to ask a question to your instructor, you don't have to ask it in front of the whole class in the public chat. You can click on their name and privately message them. Uh, and I anticipate that students will want to do that because I know some students are more hesitant to ask questions in front of the whole class. There will be additional help center time via WebEx. So that will be with TAs and it will be the weeks before both exams, so the midterm and final exam. And exams are going to be open book, time limited, cumulative online quizzes. So through Brightspace, there will be online quizzes. You'll log in there and you'll answer your question. There are a mix of multiple choice, short answer, uh, matching, all different kinds of questions. So here are my some of my personal observations, and I'm sure some of you have some comments or maybe additions to this. So there are definitely some positives of online learning. And I think we really need to focus on those to keep ourselves motivated and happy in the current world, basically. Uh, so they have a flexible schedule. They have a much more flexible schedule than we did before. So you can view asynchronous material at any time you want. Uh, and not only can you view it once, you can view it three times if you didn't get it the first time. So I've been in presentations before where I completely zoned out and I'm thinking about my grocery list. And that's just being honest. And if you're doing five courses, then it's expected that sometime during the day you'll zone out and you won't be given your 100%. So with this ability, you're able to review content and you can really go back and play that slide again if you really didn't understand what that slide was talking about. I think this is a huge resource. I think this is going to 
I think you're all going to find it very, very helpful once you start your courses if your uh, instructor does provide this kind of material. It's self-paced learning. So some students have uh, accommodations or they're learning at a slower pace than other students in the classroom. And I know I talk fast. I'm a lander. I definitely talk fast. Um, so to have that ability to learn at your own pace, and if you find an instructor talking while the slides are going overwhelming, you have the ability to slow down and just look at one thing at a time. You can read the PowerPoint before you listen to the audio. Again, the self-paced learning is a great thing, I think. And possibly more resources will be available. So for my labs, I've been working all summer trying to create videos, and I'm no YouTube star. My videos are not YouTube quality, um, but they're there. And there are going to be things such as um, mineral reviews. So I'll hold up each mineral that I expect you to know, and I'll talk about its properties. And in class, I normally do this, but students are trying to take notes. They're trying to listen. They're trying to do a bunch of things. But now you're going to have a video of it. So it's going to consolidate that material in your head even better, I think. And then moving forward, I will always have this video. So I'll be able to provide it to students in the future as well. But there are definitely negatives to online learning. And the first is that engagement and communication is more difficult. So it's harder for us to get you guys involved. It's harder for us to get you guys to ask questions. And again, communication, sometimes it feels uh, to instructors, it feels like you guys aren't even there. Um, and that's a really sad feeling for people who love their jobs. So I encourage you guys to reach out to your instructors to engage in the synchronous uh, session to really try to take advantage of any resources that your course is offering. Ask questions during open or office hours. Um, your instructor is required to give you office hours. That's, that's part of our collective agreement. Uh, so we have to do that. So use them. Ask questions. Make sure you're asking questions. Uh, it makes us feel good, or me feel good at least, uh, and it helps you guys learn the material. Self-discipline and personal scheduling is essential. It's essential every semester, but even more so now. Uh, you have to stay on schedule. If your course provides you with a week-by-week -week list of topics you should be covering, you can't let it slide for three weeks um, or you're going to hate yourself come midterm or come finals. Uh, so I cannot stress enough how much you need to get a calendar. Um, Michelle and I use paper calendars because we are grandmamas. Um, <laughs> yes. But if you use a digital cal uh, calendar, you just need to be consistent with whatever you use. And that is going to be essential for your success, especially in remote learning. There's less hands-on experiment or experience, so you don't actually get to do these things. You don't get to gather the lab materials and execute the different experiments. I'm doing it in a video, and you're just making observations. Um, so we can't really learn the motor skills that I might want you to practice uh, in the lab. And I have no way. I have not thought of a way to get you to do that. But if you just practice baking a cake, I'm happy, or you know, follow instructions. <laughs> Um, I think those, those are good life skills anyway. Finding a suitable learning environment may be a challenge. And I really hope the university supports students as much as they can for anyone in St. John's, giving you some space where you can access the internet. Um, I have a child. I have two dogs. I'm in a, a cubby in my basement right now. But at least I have good internet, and I have a webcam, and I have audio. Some of you might not have that. You need to make it clear to your instructors when you don't, and really try to use the support networks that the university has. Uh, we are trying to get computers. If you can't get computers, there are a bunch of different resources uh, that we're trying to help you with if you just let somebody know. And it's a lot of screen time. I find I'm exhausted if I spend a day in front of a computer, and my job has become more of sitting in front of a computer, and your job is going to as a student, is going to become a lot of sitting in front of a computer. So if you can print material and read it away from the screen, or if you can read your textbook or take notes or make cue cards on the course material, any of that is giving you a break from screen time uh, while still learning course material. So I highly, highly recommend doing stuff like that. 
throughout the day and not just plugging like seven, eight hour days in front of a screen, uh, you will be exhausted for sure. So I'm sure some of you guys have more positive, uh, positives of online learning and negatives. Is there anything that anyone thinks that maybe going to be a problem for them that they think I should be aware of when going into this semester? That's something I have thought of. Anyone? Nope. So again, I'm just summarizing some things that I've noticed. There's lots of documents on what students are requesting and what they're going to find challenging in the upcoming semester. So most instructors are um, trying to learn what your struggles are and trying to accommodate for them. But again, you need to communicate with us or we're not going to know how to better help you um, remote learn the best to your ability. And the last slide, these are just some resource centers. And I'd like to share this with you because I, for, I've only had this job for two years. And for six years before that, I worked in a lab in the Earth Science Building, and I only had a boss. I rarely saw anyone else. Um, so when I started this job, one thing I found is that there's an amazing network of people on MUN, at MUN that are able to help you. Um, something I definitely didn't know when I did my undergrad at MUN, definitely not. Um, these resource centers are numerous, and there are so many very, very talented people out there to help you get through whatever you're going through. So on the right-hand side over here, I have MUN resource centers. That's just a list of resource centers for people who feel like they're marginalized or a minority and that they don't have a similar group of people to um, discuss with or to navigate through the problems with. And I think that this is a list of different centers that you can take advantage of. Current student info. So that's just all relevant inf info for you guys. Um, and that link will take you right to that page and there are student calendars. There's a bunch of information there. Over on the left-hand side of the slide, I have a bunch of my just favorite things. So the Center for Innovation in teaching and learning is going to be critical. If you're having trouble opening Brightspace or don't know where to find something in Brightspace, you want to contact them. You can contact them by phone or email, and their response time is phenomenal right now. I don't know how it will be in the fall, but right now they are doing their very best to help you in, in real time, virtually. The Chief Information Officer is a place where you can get software downloads. So if you're trying to prepare for the upcoming semester and you don't have uh, Microsoft Office and you feel like you're going to need it, you have a free license to that software. So you can go onto this website and you can download it. Uh, that's what I have on my personal computer and I have it on my work computer as well. You can put it on five different devices. So there are other things like SPSS, ArcGIS. Um, if you need them for a program, you can get them from that website. Academic Advising Center, if you have a major or minor in uh, mind and you don't know what courses you need, you can go there and get advice. Student Wellness and Counseling Center, everyone has their life. Everyone has their stuff they're dealing with. And it is exacerbated this semester with a pandemic and this year with a pandemic. So if you're going through a divorce or a child custody, custody battle, you're still doing that. And now there's a pandemic. So getting groceries is harder and dropping your kid to daycare is harder. So really use this if you need it. Um, your instructors aren't cheering to be counselors, and as much as we'll try to help you, our, the best thing we can do is instruct you to contact them. They are professionals, and their response rate is pretty good, because I have had students go there before and say that they felt, they felt like they were supported and getting help. The Blunden Center, if you have accommodations that you need for learning in a course, you can contact them. And they will help you get screen reading software. They will help you get one and a half or two times in a test situation if you need it. Um, I know they're not doing any in-person help this semester, but they are doing virtual help. So if they can help you uh, in a remote setting, they will. So they're really important. And then there's the International Student Advising Office. Um, again, if you're international and an international student and you're facing a specific set of challenges and you need support, you want to contact them 
And that's just one of those resource centers that I mentioned over on the right. There's many, many more. Um, there's seven, I think, in total. And the writing center. So if you kind of suck at writing and you want someone to proof a paper before you hand it in, or you're just not sure if you're good at writing and you want someone to proofread it before you hand it in, the writing center is a good resource and they will sit with you, go through your paper, edit it, and make you a better writer through, um, through helping you. So that's all. That's my last slide. Does anyone have any questions or is I think Michelle is getting them as they go. I didn't even look over there. Now I'm going to notice how hard it is to actually read that no. while presenting. You're Does doing that any questions or are you all good? Megan has actually said to us that the biochemistry um, presentation is starting now. Okay. And so we'll sign off. I do want to apologize to everyone because I talked too long. And I apologize to Amanda and I apologize to students and I'll stop talking now. Thank you all for coming today. We're delighted. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can contact us directly. Thank you guys. And thank you, Amanda. Bye everybody. <laughs>